Stanford University. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. Good evening. My name is Grant Parker. On behalf of Stanford's Department of Classics, I'd like to welcome you to the 12th Lawrence Eitner Lecture on Classical Art and Culture, a lecture series aimed at presenting classical antiquity to a wider public. It's wonderful to see such a good turnout this evening. The series has been endowed by Peter and Lindsay Joost, our cherished friends and benefactors uh, over many years, uh, friends and benefactors of Stanford Classics. Uh, and uh, in honor of uh, Lawrence Eitner, who died in 2009, <clears throat> born 80 years previously in what was then Czechoslovakia, um, Lawrence Eitner studied in Germany and fleeing Nazi atrocities came to the United States, studying at Duke and Princeton universities. At Stanford from 1963 to 1989, Professor Eitner served as director of Stanford's Art Museum, now known as the Cantor Art Center, for a long time. He also chaired what was then the Department of Art and Architecture and was himself a distinguished expert on French Romantic painting, especially Jericot, uh, with a dozen books to his name. In naming these annual lectures after him, we honor the memory of a renowned scholar, teacher, and writer who oversaw the process that raised our university's art museum from the doldrums uh, to <coughs> prominence from 1,400 to 33,000 square feet. Today, I'm thrilled to be welcoming as our speaker, Dr. Tony Freeth, who joins us from his home base in London. Surely the first Eitner lecturer to have all his degrees in mathematics from Cambridge and Bristol universities, Dr. Freeth spent 23 very successful years in film and television as an award-winning director of uh, Four Thames Television, the BBC, and Channel 4 on scientific, cultural, and social issues, as well as medical science. In the new millennium, the television cameras have turned instead on Tony himself uh, for his work on the Antikythera mechanism, the extraordinary device about which uh, he will tell us today. In making sense of this artifact, dubbed um, by um, several uh, writers as the world's first uh, computer. Uh, I think we'll get to decide for ourselves. Uh, Tony is the expert, the one whose research finally led to that aha moment in understanding this intriguing object more than a century after its discovery in 1900. His interpretations published in Nature and other top journals are the radical new advances and the definitive interpretations that would have been unthinkable without his mathematician's background, to say nothing about his director's pragmatism in getting complicated projects together. Tony, your appearance today as the Eitner lecturer is a timely demonstration of what stunning results come from collaborative bridge building research and further, that classical antiquity has not finished telling us whatever it has to say. We've been looking forward tremendously to your lecture, The Antikythera Mechanism, A Shocking Discovery from Greece. Thank you very much for the introduction, Professor Parker. Um, what you're seeing here is X-ray slices through the main surviving fragment of the Antikythera mechanism. Um, you can see all the details of the gears, uh, the pins, the bearings, the arbors, the inscriptions. It's a truly complicated device. It's also uh, probably the most extraordinary artifact ever discovered from the ancient world. Uh, and one of the true wonders of the ancient world. Uh, it's a work of genius which continues to surprise and shock us as we discover more about it. I have to say I've had a really great time here in California. Uh, I love Stanford University. I, I bought the cat. <laughs> yeah. 
It, it's, got a, it's got a fantastic uh, logo on it. It says, fear the tree. <laughs> what I've come here to say is, fear the anti kithera mechanism. It uh, will challenge all your uh, preconceptions about the classical world. First, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Walter Scheidel for inviting me to give this lecture, uh, and Professor Grant Parker, who has, has given me a very generous and warm welcome and taken me on some very memorable tours of the campus. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to thank my good friend and longtime anti Kithra collaborator, Tom Maltzbender, who's somewhere here in the audience, uh, and his fiancée, um, Ali Strand, for their very uh, warm, generous, and thoughtful and considerate uh, hospitality while I've been here. They nearly killed me. They took me to Yosemite Valley, and they took me walking up uh, to the top of Yosemite Falls. You know, I'm not a young man any longer, and I very nearly didn't make it down, I have to say. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here to give this lecture. <laughs> um, but it was a, an absolutely fantastic experience. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Peter and Lindsay Joost for their uh, very imaginative and generous support of this lecture series, this, imaginative, uh, this uh, very challenging and interesting lecture series. Um, I have to say, I, it's a great privilege to be here at Stanford giving this lecture. Um, and I'm not really sure that I'm quite up to it. But what I do know is that the anti kithra mechanism is up to it. So I hope you're going to forget my in inadequacies while you're dazzled by the genius uh, of the ancient Greeks. What I want to tell you is, uh, what I want to talk to you about is why the anti kithra mechanism was such a shocking discovery from ancient Greece. I'm going to take you on a voyage of discovery through the key questions to establish its identity. What, where, when, who, and why. The story starts, uh, obviously, with its discovery, uh, and uh, with a man called Fotis Lindiakos, uh, seen here with his family in a small island called Simi in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, which is a sponge fishing island. And Lindiakos ran sponge fishing boats. In 1900, he sent a sponge fishing boat off to travel west across the Mediterranean to their normal sponge fishing grounds. Uh, and when they reached a tiny island called Antikythera, uh, they encountered a severe storm. They had to take shelter from the storm. Uh, but when the storm subsided, the captain, Demetrius Kondos, decided to send down one of the uh, youngest divers, Elias Stadiatis, to see what he might find in the local waters. And uh, Stadiatis came up a few minutes later trembling in fear and said that he'd seen a heap of dead, naked people underwater. These turned out to be sculptures scattered on the sea floor, floor, along with a lot of other artifacts, amphorae and so on. He'd stumbled on an ancient wreck. So the captain himself went down uh, and found a bronze arm, uh, which he brought to the surface. Now, they, they had commercial pressures. They had to get on with their sponge fishing tour. So they went, carried on taking the bronze arm with them uh, and eventually went back to see me. Uh, and there, apparently, they debated as to what they might do. Should they perhaps, uh, next season, go back and plunder the wreck, or should they tell the authorities? And I don't know why it happened, but I'm sure we're all grateful that they did tell the authorities, who organized the first major underwater archaeology in history. The Greek uh, Navy provided a gunboat, the Mikali, to stand by to deter looters, and the sponge fishermen themselves were commissioned to carry out the dive. You can see them in the top right picture there. Uh, 1900, they didn't have too much luck because of storms, but in 1901, they started to bring up some very serious artifacts. It was a, a stunning find. It was a true treasure ship. It was full of 
Uh, wonderful bronzes that you can see here. Superb glassware, much of it uh, intact. Some jewellery, amphorae, tableware, many, many other objects. But one object that no one noticed or, or regarded at the time <coughs> was a corroded lump. It must have come out of the sea in one piece. This is the earliest picture we have of it, taken in 1902. Uh, and it was taken, along with all the other artefacts, to the National Archaeological Museum and set aside in a store of stuff to be examined later. And uh, then a visiting uh, former minister, Valerius Stice, came to the museum uh, and he noticed that it had split apart. And inside, uh, there were these gear wheels. The, these weren't crude mechanical gears that you might find in a windmill or a watermill. These were precision gears uh, with teeth about a millimeter long. It was a truly shocking discovery. They simply should not have been there in an ancient Greek artifact. So the key question was, what on earth uh, is this object? And I'm going to tell, spend most of this presentation telling you some of the answers to that. In the early days, there was a, a lot of confusion and arguments. Some people thought it was a navigation instrument. It had come from a ship, after all. And some uh, thought it might be a, a geared astrolabe, which is a device for tracking the stars, uh, which was closer to the truth. Um, but as with so many academic disputes, there was very heated and quite controversial dispute, and both sides were wrong. <laughs> but there was one man in this early period who did make significant progress, uh, called Albert Rehm. He was uh, a philologist, a German philologist, expert on ancient languages, and a remarkable man in many ways. Uh, later, uh, in 1930, he would become rector of Munich University, but he was strongly anti-Nazi, and he was forced out of his job and forced into what they called internal exile in Germany, uh, and he was only reinstated into his job at the end of the war. Back in 1905, though, he started to look at the fragments, particularly this Fragment C, this is one of the main fragments. The main fragments are lettered A, B, C, etc. And on the face of this fragment, he noticed some inscriptions, hard to read inscriptions. And he read uh, the name of an Egyptian month name written in Greek. Uh, and there were a lot of divisions that were clearly uh, day divisions. So this was an Egyptian calendar. He identified an Egyptian calendar dial uh, in fragment C. He inferred also that there must have been a zodiac dial. And he read a, a, some more faint inscriptions on the surface of the fragment, which he transcribed, you can see on the right. And this he identified as a parapegma, named for a star calendar in the ancient world. So Rem had clearly determined that the device was astronomical in nature. The, this is a page of uh, Rem's unpublished research notebooks. He did um, publish a couple of papers, but the most interesting work that he did remained in his unpublished research notebooks. They're a, a gold mine of interesting ideas and thoughts. And I've highlighted a, a marginal note there and you can see the numbers 76 there and 19 and the word Kalipishan and the word Mitonishan. This is another page of his notebooks and you can see the number 223. The fact that these numbers are in his notebooks means that Rem must have seen um, this fragment here, which we call fragment 19 less than five centimeters long, very tiny fragment. Uh, and we sometimes call it um, the user manual for the mechanism because it, um, it describes the underlying principles on which the mechanism worked. 
I'm going to show you that with a beautiful technique which was invented by Tom Maltzbender, who I'm currently staying with, who was then at Hewlett Packard, uh, which looks at the surfaces of objects and enhances the clarity of the surface details. Uh, and as you can see, the text absolutely leaps out with this. Uh, this is jumping ahead in a sense in the story, but um, uh, it's absolutely a key technique that we used for looking at the inscriptions. What Rem uh, must have seen was firstly uh, 19 years uh, for the Metonic cycle, Metonician. Um, and this is a cycle of the moon, which in fact originated in uh, 5th century BC Babylon, though named after a Greek astronomer, Meton of Athens. Um, he also saw 76 years for the Calypic cycle. This is an improvement by the Greek astronomer Calypos of the Metonic cycle. He took four Metonic cycles and took out a single day. Uh, and he also read Sigma Kappa Gamma 223 in the ancient Greek letters for numbers system, which is for the lunar months of the Saros eclipse prediction cycle. And I'm going to back to describe particularly the Metonic and Saros cycles in detail later. These are the key cycles you need to know to understand how the mechanism worked. Uh, in order to understand what these cycles mean, uh, I'd just like to talk a little bit about ancient astronomy. When the uh, ancients viewed the skies, every night they would see the whole dome of stars, which they referred to as the fixed stars, heave over from uh, east to west as the Earth spins in the opposite direction. But they notice the movements of some astronomical bodies relative to the stars. Uh, and these were the sun, the moon, and the five planets known in the ancient world. Uh, and they all seem to follow the same sort of path through the sky, uh, which is known as the ecliptic. And the reason they do that in modern ast astronomical terms is that the, the solar system, these are all the bodies that are close to us, uh, lies pretty much in a flat disk. And these, these movements were in the opposite direction to the movements of the stars, predominantly. Uh, they also defined a band of stars around the ecliptic and called it the zodiac, and divided it into the 12 customary signs that we know of, there's Virgo and Libra, and this gave a frame of reference for de defining the positions of the astronomical bodies. For example, the moon there we might think was about six degrees in Libra. I'm going to now take a snapshot of the moon uh, on a particular night uh, uh, near a prominent star at a particular phase, and it's moving relative to the stars in the direction of the arrow. And I, exactly 19 years later, I'm going to take a, another snapshot, and you'll see that it looks identical. And that the reason for this is the Metonic cycle. In that 19 years, the moon has gone through exactly 235 lunar months. That's the phase cycle of the moon, from new moon through full moon back to new moon. So it's, the moon is at the same phase after 19 years. And it's been through 254 sidereal months. This is the basic orbital cycle of the moon around the Earth, the cycle of the moon against the stars. So it's in the same position relative to the prominent star. So this is a, a, a brilliant predictive cycle for the moon. Rem was the first person to really understand the essence of the Antikythera mechanism as an astronomical calculating machine. Uh, he realized that it used bronze gear wheels to calculate these astronomical cycles. He got the mechanics completely wrong. He simply didn't have enough data. But he had these extraordinarily prescient ideas. You'll see at the top there's four coaxial pointers. And this is the form we think now that the front of the mechanism took. Here's another page of Rem's notebooks. And I just want to translate a couple of uh, phrases here. Uh, the first says epicycle. Uh, and the second says eccentric, in turning it turns an epicycle. 
Well, what are epicyclic gears? Um, if you uh, imagine a, a conventional mechanical clock, um, it has gears that turn on axles that sit in bearings in fixed plates. The bearings don't move, the axles don't move, the gears turn around. With epicyclic gearing, the bearing is planted on another gear so that it turns around with that other gear. The axle turns around while the gear is turning. It's really an extremely difficult to understand, advanced form of gearing, and frankly, utterly shocking to propose for ancient Greece. You'd expect to have to wait till the Middle Ages to find this sort of gearing. It's a very subtle form of gearing. Rem had these, uh, as I said, got everything mechanically wrong, but he had this extra these extraordinarily present ideas. It's 100 years later that we realize um, uh, that he was correct about this. He left this great legacy, um, but very unresolved legacy. Uh, and nearly half a century later, the next researcher was the great Derek de Solid Price, who started studying the uh, fragments uh, in the early 1950s. Uh, by 1959, he published a very famous article in Scientific American. Uh, he said the mechanism is like a great astronomical clock uh, without an escapement. At least uh, 20 gears have been preserved, including a very sophisticated assembly of gears that probably functioned as a sort of epicyclic or differential gear system. He probably got epicyclic gears from REM. His differential gear system became his most famous proposal. Price was very persistent, and more than a decade later, he teamed up with a very distinguished uh, Greek radiologist, Karolambus Karakalos, to carry out the first set of X-rays. To their complete astonishment, they found 27 gears in the main fragment. It was a truly complex uh, mechanism. Now, if you want to know what a, a mechanism does, a geared mechanism uh, that reproduces astronomical cycles, you, you want to count the teeth of the gears. And in the right-hand picture, you can see that the teeth of the gears have been marked for counting. Nearly all the gears are partial, so you get these sectors of gears, and you have to make estimates of the total number of teeth on the gear, uh, original gear from this partial information. Uh, and this was done by Carol, Carol Ambus and his wife, Emily. Uh, and then they take the results to price. Let me give you one example here. The Karakalos family said that this gear, that's the gear that nearly fills that square. You can see the teeth in the top left corner there. Uh, they estimated that this gear had 128 teeth. Now, by this time, uh, Price started to argue with the Karakalos family, much to their irritation, about their tooth counts. And um, he, Price said um, he thought that this gear had uh, 127 teeth. Uh, apparently, they were very irritated. They thought they'd done the scientific thing and that Price was massaging their figures. Let me just look at that gear here with one of our modern X-rays. And you can see the huge advantage of modern X-ray technology. You can see the traces of nearly all the teeth there. You can make a very reliable uh, tooth count estimate. And Price was correct about the tooth count. It had 127 teeth. Well, what's a tooth between friends, you might uh, ask. Um, <laughs> But it, it turned out to have great significance because 127 is half of 254. It's the large prime factor of 254, the number of sidereal months in the 19-year metonic cycle. So what Rem had found in the inscriptions, the metonic cycle, Price found embodied in the gearing. It was a very important discovery. And Price went much further than this. He described how he thought this gear was embodied into the uh, gear wheels uh, of the device. On the right there, you can see the main surviving fragment with its uh, characteristic large wheel, four-spoked wheel. 
sometimes called the main drive wheel. It goes around uh, one turn a year. Uh, on the left, there's a computer reconstruction. Uh, and you can see a, a little crown input gear, which is where the device was turned from, probably via a knob or a crank or something like that. And if you look on the back of that gear there, there's another uh, uh, smaller gear, B2, 64 teeth, also goes around once a year. Uh, Price then said there's another gear that meshes with it, C1 with 38 teeth. I should say this is not an epicyclic gear. I've suppressed the main plate here so you can see the gears, but this sits in a fixed, uh, on a fixed axis in a bearing in the main plate. Uh, and we can easily calculate how fast uh, uh, this gear turns uh, by the simple laws of meshing gears. We just divide the tooth counts and it simplifies down to 32 over 19. And 19 is clearly for the Metonic cycle. Uh, Price then said there's a couple more gears, 48 teeth, 24 teeth, simply doubles the ratio. Um, the minus sign incident is because uh, each time you mesh two gears, they turn in opposite directions. So um, this, this is the basic way the, the mechanism works. It builds up increasingly compound gear trains to calculate uh, increasingly sophisticated ratios. Then comes Price's 127 tooth gear, meshes with another little gear E2 with 32 teeth, and calculates, you do the simple arithmetic, calculates 254 over 19, which is the sidereal version of the Mesotonic cycle. It essentially calculates the average position of the moon in the zodiac. Now let me just look at the output gear for this. It's uh, got a rather strange little um, pentagonal hub uh, with a hole through it. Price thought that this gear then uh, the output of this gear then went straight up to the front dials, to the zodiac dial that Rem had proposed to show the average position of the moon in the zodiac. But in fact, the gear train takes a, a completely extraordinary journey, which I'm going to describe. This wasn't a fantasy on Price's part. Here we have in modern x-rays all the gears involved with this. Unusually for the antikythera mechanism, many of them are nearly complete. We can count the tooth counts, they all check out. This is a completely established part uh, of the Antikythera mechanism. Price also looked at the back, the gears at the back of the mechanism. And uh, you'll notice there are two large gears, E3, E4. And on them sit two uh, epicyclic gears, K1, K2. Well, why, why do we use epicyclic gears in gearing? Um, one uh, purpose for them is that if you've just got fixed axis gear trains, as we've seen with Price's gear train, then we can simply multiply and divide the tooth counts. We can't uh, add or subtract ratios. We, we simply multiply and divide them. If you want to add or subtract ratios, you've got to use epicyclic gears. It's not obvious. It's a difficult, uh, difficult concept. What Price said was that this was all part of a differential system, differential difference. It calculated a difference. He said it calculated the difference between the basic orbital cycle of the moon around the Earth, the sidereal cycle, and from that it subtracted the um, orbit of the sun around the Earth. Remember, we're in geocentric, Earth-centered astronomy here. Uh, and that subtraction produces the phase cycle of the moon, the lunar month. It's not, again, it's not obvious. It was an absolutely brilliant idea on Price's part. Unfortunately, it was wrong. And this, I think, set back Price's research by a huge amount. Um, it, he became famous for this idea. Uh, if you have a brilliant idea for which you become famous, it's kind of hard to challenge it. And uh, <laughs> he, he, di he didn't, he didn't uh, question it or challenge it. He just got famous from it. And um, one thing Price noticed in the system, there's a large gear there, E4. Uh, we call it somewhat confusingly lowercase e3 for very good reasons I won't go into. The Krakos family estimated 222 teeth for this gear. And Price wrote that uh, you might think that this had something to do with the 223 
lunar months of the Saros cycle, uh, but in this context it can have no such meaning. Uh, and the reason for that was that this large gear pair, E3, E4, went round much too fast for it to have that sort of astronomical meaning. So he discarded the idea. He put together uh, all his ideas about the gearing into a complicated gearing diagram. These are two versions of it, uh, two schematic versions of it. Uh, you can see in the middle there the little metonic gear train we followed in, in blue there. And what, it is complicated, it's difficult to understand, won't describe it in detail. What I want to say about this uh, model is that uh, everything else is wrong, completely wrong. His sun wheel is wrong, his differential gear was wrong, his four-year dial was wrong. And this is really where I came in in terms of research. Um, I wrote a paper called Challenging the Classic Research, which criticised this model on the basis that it was far too complicated for its simple outputs. It violated an essential principle in science, engineering, computer science and technology, uh, which is that you should keep thingle, things simple. It's sometimes called the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid, is, is the idea. Uh, and um, it's, it's a fundamental principle that, that everybody in, in science goes by. But Price, uh, he didn't get everything wrong. He uh, understood how the fragments, relative positions of the fragments. He got a huge amount right, in fact, um, which Rem had not been able to do. Uh, and he put this together uh, into a basic architecture of the mechanism. as a simple box with, at the front, on the left there, you can see the dials, the uh, calendar dial and the zodiac dial that Rem proposed. Uh, and at the back, he said there's a twin dial system with five turns at the top, four turns at the bottom. Uh, that, I believe, he got completely right. But he got the function of these back dials wrong. After 20 years' research, he put everything together in a truly great paper called Gears from the Greeks. By this time, Price was Avalon Professor of the History of Science at Yale University. And this paper defined the uh, antikythera, antikythera mechanism for the next generation. It became the Bible for later researchers. Now, don't misunderstand me. I really revere Price. I think he's still the greatest um, uh, researcher in Antikythera research history. Um, you don't just make uh, progress in science by getting everything right. You make progress also uh, by getting things wrong in an interesting way. And he set the agenda uh, for the whole future of research. When he died at an early age, the mantle was taken over by two more researchers. On the left there, Professor Alan Bromley from Sydney University, a professor of computer science. <coughs> Seen there, I should say, not with the Antikythera mechanism, but with part of one of Babbage's, Charles Babbage's um, computing engines. He was a considerable expert on Charles Babbage. And on the right there is Michael Wright, who was then a curator of mechanical engineering at the Science Museum in London. They had become skeptical about Price's model, I have to say some years before I had, but unknown to myself. And they determined to get new uh, x-rays, to do new x-rays. The, the problem with the Caracos x-rays was all the gears were overlapping. They were two-dimensional x-rays. You couldn't easily distinguish the 3D depth of the gears or, or the mechanical structure. And they used this early technique of 3D uh, x-rays called linear tomography. Uh, I won't go into the technique. It's, it's very hard to interpret the results. Now, I should say, sadly, that Alan Bromley uh, died before the full fruits of this research could, um, could take place. Um, but Michael Wright was extremely persistent uh, and made some very fundamental discoveries on the mechanism, uh, which I've listed there. I don't possibly have space here I, to, to go into the, all of Michael Wright's research. Uh, but he uh, produced some very important results. And I'm going to talk about some of these as I go through. Um, to start with, I'm going to talk about this metonic calendar. That's the upper back dial of the mechanism. 
That's the dial which Price said was a four-year dial, which was frankly a very um, boring and simplistic idea. But in Gears from the Greeks, Price also wrote uh, that there's a possibility that there might be 47 months for each turn of this dial, five turns of the dial, 547s is 235, and it might be a metonic calendar dial. But he threw away his brilliant idea, uh, and it was taken up with great perception by Michael Wright, uh, who went much further. He proposed gearing for turning the pointer of this uh, calendar dial. I'm going to strip off the case and show you the gearing. It starts just the same way as um, uh, Price's uh, Metonic uh, gear train with a little gear with 38 teeth with the same result. Uh, and then there is a gear with 53 teeth. Now bear with me going through these, this rather detailed look. It is really, I assure you, worth it. Now, I was a mathematician and 53 teeth, it's a bizarre prime number. It's not a prime number that you'd expect to turn up. It's got no apparent meaning. Um, in my own developing model at the time, I changed it to 54, which turned out to be a huge mistake. If we look at this gears with our x-rays, we have enough teeth to make a tooth count estimate, and 53 is the correct answer for it. Its meaning is, is um, extraordinary. I'm going to put the rest of the gear train in that Michael Wright proposed. And you'll notice that there's a second gear there with 53 teeth, which it's a conjectural gear. We don't have any physical evidence for it, but it must have been there um, because we only want the ratio 5 over 19. It's a five-turn dial over 19 years. So the 53 teeth gears cancel each other out. So what on earth are they doing there? Why is this gear train so complicated? It dramatically seems to contradict the KISS principle that you should keep things simple. Understanding this was understanding the heart of the Antikythera mechanism. By 2005, uh, Michael Wright had produced a model uh, which had the planets at the front uh, on a very bold scheme he had with eight coaxial pointers for the date, sun, moon, and five planets. Uh, and I believe he's fundamentally correct about that. I have arguments with him about the gearing. I think his gearing is far too complicated. He'd revived um, Price's idea of a metonic calendar uh, with great perception and proposed the gearing. Uh, but for the bottom dial, he had a draconitic month dial. Now, the dra draconitic month uh, is a month which is to do with, uh, uh, with the possibility of an eclipse happening. Um, and Michael Wright had modified Price's differential to produce this draconitic month. Price's model produced the lunar month. Michael Wright modified the tooth counts on the gears to produce the draconitic month, uh, and he said that it was displayed, four draconitic months were displayed over the four turns of the dial on a scale with 218 half days. Uh, as soon as I read this, I, I was sure that it had to be wrong. In parallel with Michael Wright's wor work, there was a new initiative set up uh, by a distinguished uh, astronomer at Cardiff University in Wales uh, called Professor Mike Edmonds in the top left corner picture there. And he gathered a group of people around him, including Greek astronomers and including myself, uh, who were interested in the mechanism. Now, by this time, I'd become completely fascinated with the Antikythera mechanism. I'd become absolutely passionate about it or as my wife sometimes puts it, obsessed with it. Um, we also, I, I was extremely frustrated um, that we had no good data. We didn't have a good set of still photographs. Uh, we couldn't find the Karakalos x-rays anywhere. Uh, and Michael Wright didn't want to share his data with us. So I started to look around for new ways of gathering 
data on the antikythera mechanism. Uh, and in a um, science magazine, New Scientist, I found an article uh, about a brilliant technique invented by Tom Maltzbender, who's sitting somewhere over there, can't see him, but who was then at Hewlett Packard um, Laboratories. And this is the technique that you saw with fragment 19 for looking at surfaces. This is what we wanted to, to see the inscriptions on the surfaces uh, of the fragments. But we wanted to look inside them at, in the, with the gears, at, with, with 3D x-rays. And I found this, uh, another uh, world-leading company called Xtech Systems, uh, just northwest of London, set up by Roger Hadland, who's the man in the middle of the bottom right group there. And um, so we, we had all our techniques that we wanted to use on the mechanism, uh, and the sticking point was getting uh, permission from the Greek authorities. Now, this took nearly five years. Um, we, at one stage, we, we were turned down uh, early on in the process. Uh, we then got a grant from the Leverhulme Trust to, to fund everything. Um, uh, and just about a month later, we were turned down again. So we had our, uh, our um, technology teams, we had our money, but we couldn't do the project. And it was only because of the huge persistence of Professor Xenophon Moussas, who is in the top, the bottom left of the top, top left group, uh, that uh, we actually finally got permission to do the thing. The whole thing was, frankly, a nightmare and, and very tough on myself because we just spent years failing to get our permissions. But in the fall of 2005, uh, we ended up at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. And there we were looked after by two senior staff, uh, archaeologist Mary Zafiropoulou on the left there, and head of chemistry, Dr. Eleni Mangu. <coughs> when we started uh, our studies, uh, we knew of these fragments here plus a few more um, bits and pieces that Price mentioned in Gears from the Greeks. Uh, and then one day, Mary came to our team and said she'd found some more boxes of bits in the basement store of the museum. Uh, might we be interested? Um, well, of course, they were labeled Antikythera. Of course we were interested. To cut a long story short, we ended up with 82 fragments in all. And we took new still photographs of them, which you can see here. And we subjected all the fragments to our two investigative techniques. Uh, bottom left, bottom right, you can see Tom Maltzbender with his mysterious dome covered in flashlights that he uses for his um, reflectance transformation imaging or polynomial texture mapping as we knew it in those days. Um, Top left, you can see Xtech Systems man handling an eight-ton X-ray machine into the basement of the museum in Athens. It was a special prototype machine that they'd made for this project. If you want to do 3D X-rays, you need to be able to penetrate your samples through all the angles, including the long angles. So they made an X-ray machine with double the X-ray power of anything else comparable in the world at the time. So around there, you see a lot more images of uh, data gathering. And of course, the most important activity there in the center, which was having fine meals in the restaurants in Athens. <laughs> After a week with Hewlett Packard, two and a half weeks with Xtech Systems, both brought superb teams. I have to say they were, they were wonderful teams to Athens. We ended up with a superb set of data around a terabyte of data. What you see there is a mixture of still photographs, um, the Hewlett-Packard surface imaging technique, and slices through the 3D X-ray volumes produced by Xtech systems, some in false color. The most important thing to realize about this data is that everything you see there is at millimeter scales. Size of the teeth of the gears about a <coughs> millimeter long. All the text, two millimeters or under, typically 1.6 millimeters. And this exquisite detail preserved despite 2,000 years underwater. We'd expected that uh, the Hewlett Packard technique would show the inscriptions that cover the surface plates and that Xtech's 
3D x-rays which show us the gears inside the fragments and that all turned out to be true. But another wonderful revelation was that the x-rays also showed us a text inside the fragments, completely invisible from the surface, uh, hidden for 2,000 years, unread for 2,000 years. Price found around 1,000 text characters. We've now read between three and 4,000. It was a wonderful revelation. When we got this data, we all took it back to our facilities to um, examine it. And I was charged with trying to sort out the mechanical structure of the device. And I started not with the main fragment, fragment A, because we had some severe technical difficulties with the data for that. So I started with this little fragment F, uh, one of the fragments Mary had found in the basement store, around nine centimeters long. And it, it looks like nothing special at all, like something you might pick up on a beach. A bit of green suggesting some bronze, maybe. Uh, and I'm going to look at it with X-ray slices. I'm going to take a slice through near the front of it there. And there's really nothing of any interest there. And I'm going to go down through the fragment in parallel slices, close apart, uh, to see what we can find. If I go down through the fragment, I start to see what looks like part of a dial. And I go down further, it becomes sharper. Uh, and then I see these scale divisions, uh, and then more scale divisions. And I developed a very simple strategy, which is if you want to know what a dial does, uh, and you've only got part of it, and you've got scale divisions, in order to understand its function, you want to try and extrapolate the number of divisions around the whole dial. It's an obvious strategy, but I have to say it was not followed with any great consistency by previous researchers. Uh, now, these scale divisions reminded me very much of some more scale divisions that Price had seen visible on the surface at the back of the main fragment, fragment A. Looked very similar. And I could determine the relative orientations of the fragments and put them together. Uh, together with another little fragment E with similar divisions in it. Uh, and suddenly I had a, quite a lot of data around this dial uh, on which to extrapolate the total number of divisions around the dial. And this came, you may have guessed the answer already, this, the, the number of divisions uh, around the dial came to the remarkable number 223. Uh, this was it was clear that this must be an eclipse prediction dial. This was our first uh, major breakthrough from our new data. I just want to explain a little bit about the Saros cycle and how it works. If you have an eclipse of the sun or the moon in a particular month, and you look 223 lunar months later, just over 18 years later, uh, you get another very similar eclipse of the sun or the moon. And this repeat eclipse goes on repeating for 12 to 15 centuries. It's a very remarkable cycle. It works because 223 lunar months uh, is the same as a whole number of draconitic months. This is a month that tells us whether an eclipse is possible. Uh, and the the fact that it's the same as a whole number of anomalistic months, the anomalistic month is the variable motion cycle of the moon. The moon sometimes looks as if it's going slower against the stars and sometimes faster. We, in modern terms, we know that's because it has an elliptical orbit, sometimes it's further away. And this ensures that the repeat eclipse is very similar. It's a remarkable chance resonance between three of the uh, uh, orbital cycles of the moon. Now, there was more in this little fragment F than that. If you look uh, between the scale divisions, and I'll show you those uh, in some of x-ray slices, you can see these little groups of uh, text letters and symbols, uh, which I call glyphs. And if you look round the dial, uh, there's some inscriptions. And again, this reminded me of what Price had seen visibly at the back of Fragment A, um, 
there's two glyphs there that you can see, and round the dial, uh, some inscriptions, hard to read inscriptions. Again, beautifully enhanced with uh, Tom Maltzbender's technique. So now I could trace all these glyphs in our frag three fragments, A, E, and F, and put them all round the dial in their correct positions. And you'll notice that some of them uh, are, a lot of them are, are six months apart, some of them just five months apart, and some of them are, are in adjacent months. This is exactly the pattern of eclipses of the sun and moon in the astronomical record. So the glyphs must be the eclipse predictions. I'd like to look more closely at them uh, and discuss what they mean. There's clearly more information in these glyphs than just the presence of a, a lunar or solar eclipse. So let me decode uh, some of their meaning. At the top of some of them, there's a sigma, which I soon realized uh, stood for Selene, the ancient Greek goddess of the moon, clearly indicating a lunar eclipse. At the top of some, Eta, Elios, god of the sun, for a solar eclipse. Uh, some of the glyphs, like the one in the middle there, had both a sigma and an Eta for a month, which had both a uh, lunar and a solar eclipse. All the glyphs had this um, unusual anchor-type symbol, which took me a long time to decode until I finally found it in a book of uh, ancient Greek horoscopes. And it's a combination of omega and rho, ligature of omega and rho, standing for aura, uh, Greek for hour. And it's always followed by either a letter, or in this case, a special symbol digamma for the number six uh, in the Greek letters for numbers system. So this indicates the hour of the eclipse. The mechanism didn't just predict the presence of an eclipse in a particular month, but the hour of the day of the eclipse, many years or decades hence. Now, at the bottom of all these glyphs, uh, there was another letter, which I'd seen, but I hadn't understood. And after our first paper was published in Nature, um, a very distinguished uh, historian of ancient astronomy, Professor Alexander Jones, uh, came to our conference that we organized, and he told me something that I'd missed about these letters. I feel somewhat shamefaced to admit that I missed this, but uh, they are in alphabetical order. And there's a whole alphabet, alphabet's worth of index letters without bars on, followed by uh, a, a, a second alphabet with bars on top. And these, these must surely in some way refer to the inscriptions around the dial. So, um, uh, by this time I had a nice story that I had the, uh, the uh, dial as an eclipse prediction dial, I had the glyphs, uh, and this index letter system. I can't go into the whole system, I don't have space. If you're interested, you can Google Antikythera and PLOS One, that's Public Library of Science One, uh, and it's an open access journal, anyone can read it. I'd just say that this is a, a prediction scheme of quite uh, astonishing ambition. The, the um, index letters, you look at the index letter in the glyph, you look at it in the inscriptions, and that tells you characteristics of the eclipse. Um, it's an extraordinary scheme. But going back to late 2005, what I wanted to know was how was the pointer turned? Like Michael Wright had determined how the pointer was turned for the upper dial. Um, so we need to go uh, behind the plate uh, and look at the gearing. That's all the gearing we saw for Michael Wright's um, uh, gearing for the metonic calendar dial. And I want to turn the lower back dial. And again, I've suppressed the main plate so you can see the gears, but there's really only one uh, axis which can turn this, and that's this little axis M. The gearing branches here to the upper back dials and to the lower back dials. And I need a gear with 223 teeth. It's a prime number, can't break it down into smaller gearing. And if you look at the back of the main fragment, fragment A, uh, there's really only one good candidate gear, E3 there. 
It's not the ring gear inside it, it's the bigger gear, slightly harder to see outside that. This is the gear that Price called E4 uh, and the Caracalos family counted as 222 teeth. Price rejected the idea that it was uh, uh, the 223 months of the Saros cycle. Uh, but if we look in our x-rays, we can see many teeth, we can make a reliable tooth count, and 223 is the right answer. Price had had, again, a brilliant idea uh, which he'd thrown away. And he threw it away because of his differential. Now, let me put that into our gear diagram. There's the gear pair there. Uh, we need to turn it from this little axis M here. And now we can start to calculate how fast these gears turn. We know already how fast axis M turns. It's this bizarre fraction with the number 53 in, which you'll remember, uh, which cancelled itself up in Wright's uh, gear train. Uh, we calculate how far fast E3, E4 turn, and we get this rather strange fraction, 9 times 53 over 223 times 19. Um, but it will turn out to be a very significant ratio, as we'll see. The next gear in the train is another gear with 53 teeth. And by this time, I was getting um, extremely disturbed by all of this, because uh, again, the 53 is cancelled out. It's not used in this uh, gear train. If we look at what we need, uh, uh, sorry, just to say, this is the gear, reliable count says 53 teeth. So it, it was correct. If we look at the gear train, we don't want 53 in the final answer. We just want, it's a four turn dial, two to three months, 235 over 19, that's the metonic cycle. That's the ratio we want to turn our Saros pointer. We don't need this extraordinary, bizarre, strange and disturbing prime number 53. So that's what we want for the Saros pointer. This gear E3, this large gear, found no role in any previous model. Now it has two roles. It turns, no, sorry, it has one role. It has an essential role in turning the Saros pointer. So everything now seemed to be going on the right lines. In our modern x-rays, we can see all these gears except for the conjectural one. All the tooth counts check out. It's a completely established part of how the Antikythera mechanism works. And so this was a nice story. I had the dial, I had the gearing, but I also had a huge problem, uh, which is if you look at the back of fragment A, inside the large gear E3, uh, there's another couple of gears there. They were part of what Price referred to as his differential system, which I was sure by that time was wrong. Uh, and I'm going to look at them more closely, and I'm going to examine uh, them with our x-rays. Now, if you look there, the um, gears on the left look like they're the gears on the right, uh, but they're not actually those gears. I have to come forward a millimeter towards us, and you see then two more gears, and these are the gears on the right. There's, there's four gears in this system, to Price's great credit, he saw that. And I want to look at the uh, bottom gears, which are epicyclic gears, K1 and K2, uh, and a particular feature of K2, uh, which is very evident there, which is that it's got this notch out of it. Now, this was um, noticed in uh, 1902, very early on, by Rados, but he didn't understand it. It was noticed by Price, who thought it was evidence that uh, a tooth had broken, had been repaired, and the repair had dropped out. Uh, but Michael Wright, with his new x-rays, made uh, an, a, a far more acute observation. He said that there's a pin on K1, which engages with a slot on K2, and in that way, uh, gear K1 carries gear K2 around. Now, I think most people's reaction would, would be that this is a, an entirely useless idea. You, the gears will turn with the same speed, and you might simply just as well attach them 
to the same axle. But Wright made another really astonishing um, uh, observation. He said that the gears turn on slightly different axes, slightly eccentric axes. The difference in the centers is just about a millimeter. Uh, and this makes all the difference. I want you to forget for a moment that these are epicyclic gears, and I'm going to show you a little animation that shows what this system does. I'm going to imagine that K2, uh, K1 sorry, goes round uh, at a constant rate of the mean sidereal month. Uh, that's the gear with the pin on there. You can see K1. And on top of it sits uh, K2. And as the gears turn, you'll see sometimes K2 is behind, uh, and sometimes it's ahead of the pin gear. The slot gear is, you get this little variation uh, in the motion of the slot gear. Notice that in this fixed axis situation, the period of rotation of the slot gear is the same as the input period, the sidereal month. And I'll come back to that. So going back to our actual mechanism, the key question was, could this model the variable motion of the moon? Wright considered this in a rather throwaway paragraph in one of his papers. Uh, and he discarded the idea because in his model of 2005, this large gear E3 rotated much too fast, 60 times too fast, uh, for this to work in any meaningful way. He rejected this idea for exactly the same reason that Price rejected the idea that E3 might have 223 teeth. The gear E3 turned much too fast. But in my developing model, E3 turns, you remember, the Saros um, dial, which is a dial which has a period of 18 years over a four-turn cycle. Everything's very slow. So it's going around very slowly. So maybe this is a promising idea. The second key question is, why is the pin and slot mounted epicyclically on E3? Uh, and I'm going to explain why that is. Uh, and I'm going to revert now to modern astronomy to talk about the reason. This is the uh, lunar orbit. And it's an ellipse, as we know, in modern astronomy. I've exaggerated the ellipse there very much. It's much more like a circle, uh, but it is, it is elliptical. Apogee is the point when uh, uh, the moon is furthest from the Earth and perigee when it's closest. Uh, Apogee is when the moon appears to be going slowest against the stars because it's furthest away and perigee when it's going fastest. And I want you to imagine the moon starting at a prominent star, which you can see on the right, going all the way round the zodiac uh, and back to the same prominent star. This is the sidereal month, which we've talked about period of about 27.32 days on average. Now, you might think that the moon then had got back to its slowest motion at apogee. But in fact, that's not the case because the apogee has moved round a little bit in the meanwhile. It just the so-called line of apsides that joins perigee and apsides processes round in a very slow period of just under nine years. So the anomalistic month, uh, stay with me if you can, the anomalistic month, which is this, um, the month of the variable motion cycle of the moon, is just a bit longer than the sidereal month, only about five and a half hours longer. Remarkably, the ancient Babylonian astronomers knew of this um, difference between the sidereal and the anomalistic month, as did the ancient Greeks, but none of them knew about elliptical orbits. But the ancient Greeks were brilliant uh, uh, geometers, and they had uh, a very beautiful theory for explaining this uh, uh, anomalous orbit of the moon. They said you can explain it as the sum of two simple circular motions. There's a, a, a large circular motion with the, uh, a period of the sidereal month on which, and a little epicyclic added circular motion uh, with the period anomalistic month in the opposite direction. Now, that's all a bit of a mouthful, so I'm going to show you an animation of this uh, theory. Uh, the pink dot is the actual moon, and it's uh, 
trace this out an orbit, which is like a squashed off-center circle. Uh, each time it's slightly different as it goes round, and each time it takes a bit longer than at the sidereal month to get to the red line to get to apogee. Sometimes the moon is behind the average moon, and sometimes it's ahead of the moon. And it models the uh, elliptical theory, the modern theory of the moon, uh, in a very beautiful way. Um, yes, the, the, the red line there is equivalent to the line of absides of the orbit. Um, that's the one end is the, where it's furthest from the Earth and the other end where it's closest, where it appears to be moving furthest. So this is the ancient Greek epicyclic theory of the moon. Very beautiful theory. And I'm going to return to my mechanism now uh, to ask some questions. And the key question is, how fast must this large gear E3 rotate so that this little pin and slot device exactly models this ancient Greek epicyclic theory? You remember that its basic input needs to be the sidereal month, but the period of the variability needs to be this other slightly longer month, the anomalistic month. Uh, and I have to say this indeed easy. If you're encountering this for the first time, it may be you're not following it in total detail. I want to give you a flavor of, of, of what the thinking was. So the question then is, how fast should E3 rotate to make this pin and slot exactly um, be equivalent, uh, geometrically equivalent to the um, epicyclic theory of the moon? And the answer turns out to be that it must rotate at the rotation, which is the difference between the sidereal month and the anomalistic month, equivalent in modern terms of the rotation of line of absides, this slow rotation with a period of just under nine years. Now, we can calculate this from the Metonic and Saros cycles. I'll let you do that as a little exercise to do at home. Um, I don't really have time, but it's simple arithmetic. And when we do that simple arithmetic, we come out with this fraction 9 times 53 over 223 times 19, which you'll remember we already have as the rotation of E3 when we were calculating uh, the uh, gearing for the lower back dial, the Saros, Saros dial. So now we understand what the 53 tooth gear is doing there. It's turning E3 at exactly the right rate so that the pin and slot models this ancient Greek theory of the moon. It is, I have to say, extraordinary. Now, E3, it, it had no role in any previous models. Now it's got two roles. It turns the Saros pointer and it carries epicyclically this little pin and slot device um, to um, model the epicyclic theory of the moon. Let me put this together. That's E3 rotating at this rate, just under, with a period of just under nine years. Um, that's, you remember, Price's little metonic gear train on the little, which output on a little regular pentagon with a hole through it. This calculates the mean sidereal month. Uh, let me show you this in close-up. There's a gear with 50 teeth sits on there, meshes with the pin gear, which also has 50 teeth, on which sits the slot gear with 50 teeth, and this generates this variable motion, uh, and then it transmits it back, reversing its direction, onto another gear with 50 teeth. So to summarize this system, we have the pin and slot mounted epicyclically to change the period in which it delivers its variation from the sidereal month to the anomalistic month. It is a truly astonishing system. I would say a shocking system. It's, um, in my view, an incredible idea. It's a work of absolute genius. And realizing that this is how it worked, a whole cascade of con consequences came out then that all the tooth counts could be explained from the Metonic and Saros cycle. And it's often in science you make a, a breakthrough and everything else follows from it. It was a fantastic feeling of, of, um, uh, of discovery. 
But we hadn't really quite finished there. That's the same gearing seen from the side. You can see the output, uh, which calculates this variable sidereal month there. And I'd assume, like everybody else, that the gearing at the back of the mechanism went off to the left to the back dials. But this didn't seem to make much sense. And then uh, two or three weeks later, I got a call from Mike Edmonds uh, with a very nice insight. He said, what if the output went the other way through the little hole, you remember, in the pentagonal hub? We can see all this stuff in our x-rays, I should say. It's not uh, uh, made up. Um, towards, and the output went up towards the zodiac dial at the front of the device to show the position of the moon in the zodiac. That's where you want the, this uh, sidereal month output. You might consider that this uh, was a completely crazy thing to uh, attempt in ancient Greece. But the craziness of the designer didn't stop there. The designer added another little device on the end of this output. And I'm going to show you that from another angle. Uh, and it shows the phase of the moon. This was a discovery by Michael Wright. And I want to take the cover of this uh, off to show you how it works. It's just got two little gears in it. It's got an epicyclic crown gear with 20 teeth, which meshes with uh, another little gear with 20 teeth on the solar output of the device. And it's a differential device. It calculates the difference between the sidereal rotation of the moon around the Earth and the rotation of the sun around the Earth, the annual cycle of the sun around the Earth, to produce the phase cycle of the moon. Now, where have you heard that before? That was what Price's differential did, what Price's brilliant differential did. But he got it in completely the wrong place with this cumbersome system. The genius who devised this device, just two little gears, which did exactly what Price's differential did. I just want to put all this together to show you how the gearing relates to the fragments uh, and what the whole thing looks like. This is the back of fragment A. These are the gears at the back there. You can see the pin and slot there, the gears for the top dials and for the bottom dial, dials. These are the fragments that show the back plate of the mechanism with the twin dial system, top and bottom. We come round now to the front of fragment A, and you can see these rather mysterious fingers that point up from the main drive wheel, which we believe are part of a conjectural planetary system, first proposed by Michael Wright. This is my radically simplified gearing for it. And it ends with Wright's proposal of eight coaxial pointers showing the date, the sun, the moon, and all five planets known in the ancient world. This is fragment C, and it comes from all over the front of the mechanism. Quite a jigsaw puzzle to sort out. The middle part of it shows, shows the moon phase device. Then there's the zodiac and calendar scales. And all these, plus these little fragments here, uh, show Rem's parapegma at the top, the star calendar at the top and bottom of the device. Everything in a wooden box turned by a little uh, knob or crank at the side. If that doesn't shock you, I don't know what will. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'm going to say about what. And I've got some short sections now uh, to further explore the identity uh, of the mechanism. And one, was, uh, one question is, where was it made? Well, the archaeology is the first port of call for this. There have been two major studies on this, both high-quality studies, uh, particularly the superb study by the uh, archaeologists um, at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens uh, under their then director, Dr. Nicholas Kaltsas. Both studies agree about the geographic origin uh, of the cargo, uh, and it was scattered all over the ancient Greek world, mostly in the eastern part, but still some uh, amphora from Italy, coin from Syracuse, and so on. Um, the ship was almost certainly traveling from east to west, uh, probably going to Rome, but not definitely. 
The route of the ship, whatever you read on the internet, is not really known. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet about the antikythera mechanism, I have to say. You have to be rather careful. And the cargo really tells us almost nothing about the origin of the mechanism. So we want more sorts of information. And there are some very remarkable classical texts by Cicero, um, who wrote uh, first about uh, a device made by uh, Posidonius, which at each revolution reproduces the same motions of the sun, the moon, and the five planets that take place in the heavens every day and night. Sounds just like the Antikythera mechanism. And um, Cicero knew Posidonius. He was a, a pupil of Posidonius as in his Stoic school of philosophy uh, in Rhodes. So this might suggest there's a connection with Rhodes. Uh, but Cicero also wrote uh, about Archimedes. Archimedes was killed in the siege of Syracuse in 212 BC. And Cicero wrote, reports that the victorious Roman general Marcellus took just two, they were described as globes, spheri, uh, which are thought to refer to these sort of mechanisms that Archimedes had made. And again, the description um, sounds just like the Antikythera mechanism. The motions of the sun and moon and of those five stars, which are called wanderers, the five planets, Archimedes had thought out a way to represent accurately by a single device for turning um, the globe to represent accurately by a single device for turning the globe those various and divergent movements with their different rates of speed, just like the Antikythera mechanism. But Archimedes was based in Syracuse in Sicily. So I'm going to add this to our map. Two possible origins uh, widely spaced across the ancient Greek empire. But we'd like much better uh, information than this. And some of comes from the um, from essentially cultural information uh, in this little fragment B, which is our evidence for the upper back dial, the Metonic calendar dial. Let me show you that fragment rotated and with the little month divisions around the 235 month dial indicated in blue. And if you look very closely, you can see some inscriptions between the month divisions. And I'll just go down through some x-rays. Typically, you have to go down through many x-ray slices. Um, in this case, it turned out to be 60 slices to read the text, because um, everything's uneven and it's hard to read. Let me just show you a close-up of one of the month cells there. And I can trace the text. Um, and I didn't have any idea what this meant. Uh, I don't read Greek. I don't know ancient Greek, so I talked to my Greek colleagues, and they couldn't work out what, what this meant. Um, and then uh, we agreed to send it to Alexander Jones. And by return email, he said he believed that these were month names written over several lines, which certainly made sense. Now, it's kind of difficult to figure out what that month name is. But because the calendar has 235 months, uh, the month names will be repeated many times around the dial, so I can find the same month name uh, in another month cell, put the information together, and I get the month dodecates. Now, after several weeks, or even I think it was months of work, um, Alex Jones and I managed to decipher all 12 month names, or at least I deciphered one and Alex deciphered 11. He, he's the, <laughs> <laughs> he, he was the expert, and that's what they looked like. We were extremely lucky um, that we just had enough information from the x-rays and some characters from uh, Tom Maltzbender's PTMs to get just enough information to get all the month names. And there was a a hidden message in this calendar. Um, if you look at uh, calendars in the ancient world, they're very individual to individual city-states, but the month names themselves are scattered over a wide geography. Um, this was basically worked out by Alex Jones based on work by 
Katerina Trumpy. If you look, say, at the uh, blue month names there, you can see on the map, if you look very closely, map prepared by Lina Anastasi of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, you can see little blue squares. The bigger the square, the more the local calendar, number of months in the local calendar coincides with the Antikythera calendar. And you can see these blue squares right across the ancient Greek world. They don't tell us about geography. If we look at the green month names in the little green squares, you have to look quite carefully. Um, more in the eastern part, but still scattered right across a wide geographic distribution. No good for determining the origin of the mechanism. But four of the months in red there um, were exceptional months. They were rare months. Uh, and they came uniquely from the calendar of Corinth or Corinth's colonies in northwestern Greece or in Sicily. And so this established uh, that the calendar was a Corinthian calendar. It's a very exciting new result. And we got even more excited by the idea that maybe this linked the mechanism to Sicily and Archimedes. Um, but later work by John Morgan and Paul Iverson at Case, Case Western University suggests that this is wrong. They believe that this is the calendar, uh, a calendar most likely from the northwestern area of Greece called Epiros. Um, let me put that on the map there. That's Epiros there. And this was quite convincing evidence that there's a connection with Epiros. This was a pretty surprising, um, surprising result. I mean, everyone had assumed up till that point that the mechanism maybe came from Rhodes or Alexandria or somewhere like that. No one had suggested um, the Epiros region of northwestern Greece. And there was more information in this little fragment B. If you look there, there's a little subsidiary dial inside the Metonic calendar dial. Let me show you that in close up. And one day I read the word Nemea around it. Had no idea what it meant. Looked it up on the internet and found that uh, Heracles had killed a lion there. Well, I'm, I don't know ancient Greek cultural language, so I have to try the internet. And Heracles had killed a lion. That didn't seem particularly relevant to the Antikythera mechanism. So again, I sent it to Alex Jones, again by return email. It always seemed to be by return email with Alex. Um, he said uh, that one of the major um, athletic games, the Panhellenic games in ancient Greece, was held at Nemea. And again, we spent some weeks and managed to decipher um, many more names around this dial. We found the Isthmian deck games for the games at Corinth, the Pythian games for the games at Delphi, uh, and finally, rather small, I have to say, the Olympia for the Olympic games uh, at Olympia. Now, these are the major crown games uh, of the uh, athletic Panhellenic Pan athletic cycle. Um, it established clearly that this was an Olympiad dial, a four-year dial. Remember, Price had a four-year dial, but he put it in completely the wrong place again. Extraordinary, really. But we had these, these crown games. This was an Olympiad dial. But you'd expect these crown games to be on any, any dial on any mechanism that had an Olympiad dial would have these crown games. They were the major games. But in ancient Greece, there were hundreds of little minor games. And there was one up here called the Na, and another one here, which was pretty much undecipherable. There was clearly there was text there, but none of us could work out what the text might mean. So let me deal with the Na first. Does anyone happen to know where the Nyan games, the Na, were held? No, well, let me tell you, they were held at Dodona in the Epiros region of northwestern Greece. Dodona was a major um, oracular site, second only to Delphi, and the Nyan games were held there. So we were building up a very nice, confident uh, story about the origin of the Antikythera mechanism. 
But there was a sting in the tail of this research. If I can go back to my dial. Uh, a couple of uh, years ago, Paul Iverson made a suggestion for what this other minor games might be, uh, and he suggested the Ali Ea. And uh, I'm almost certain that he's correct. Well, again, let me go back to my geography. Does anyone know where the Ali Ea were held? No, they were held in Rhodes. So our comfortable uh, story <laughs> fell apart. And um, we really don't know how to resolve this. I think you have to make up your own narrative. It could have been made by somebody in Rhodes for a client in Epiros or made by somebody in the Epiros region who'd spent their youth running in the games in Rhodes. We really don't know. But this is the best uh, information we have about the origin of the mechanism. Um, still unresolved, but it, very interesting, I think. So let me look at when. A crucial question for determining uh, the mechanism's identity. Again, the archaeology is the starting point. Both studies agree objects from the wreck, 4th century BC to the middle of the 1st century BC. There's a general consensus that the wreck was probably in about 65 BC. Uh, and this gives us a terminus antiquem for the mechanism in the mid first century BC. And I'm going to add this information to a timeline this time. These two studies say terminus antiquem mid first century BC. But obviously we, we want uh, closer information than this. And there's information in the inscriptions, uh, the epigraphic analysis of the inscriptions and epigraphers of which I'm very much not one, um, look, do stylistic analysis of the letter forms and can give information from that about the date of the inscription. They notice things like the omicrons are all small, the pies tend to have their second leg shorter than the first, and the top and bottom strokes of the sigmas are splayed. Now, I have to say this process is a bit more uh, an art than a science, and different epigraphers disagree. Uh, let me put some information about uh, different epigraphers' views uh, on our timeline. Wilhelm, in the early days, probably wisely gave a rather wide <laughs> range. <laughs> um, Merritt worked with Price and said basically first century BC, which agreed with Price. He says the subtitle of Gears from the Greeks is a calendar computer from about 80 BC. And he had an argument for saying it was made in 80 BC, uh, which I think all of us now believe uh, is spurious. Kritsas worked with our group and brought the date considerably earlier. And I've worked most recently with Charles Crowther, a brilliant epigraphist from Oxford University, and he's brought the date even earlier. But we'd still like a, a firmer date. And some information comes out of the astronomy. Remember Rem's cycles that he identified in this fragment? Well, the latest of these is the Calypic cycle, launched on a very specific date in 330 BC. So this gives us a terminus postquem for the mechanism in 330 BC. Let me add that to my timeline. There it is. Not a huge advance here. Um, but there's more in the astronomy than that. You remember that it took four generations of researchers to work out this uh, that the mechanism exactly models the ancient Greek epicyclic theory of the moon. And the second century AD, Ptolemy attributed this invention of this theory to Hipparchus of Nicaea with those dates there. But Apollonius of Perga, it's known, developed epicyclic theories of the planets. And he was said to have been called Epsilon because the shape of an Epsilon is like a crescent moon because of his work on the moon. So it seems very plausible, even likely, that Apollonius might have developed an epicyclic theory of the moon. So let me add that to our um, information. Depends who you believe um, invented this epicyclic lunar theory. 
So that's where it remained until a year or two ago, um, some quite astonishing work by uh, an Argentinian researcher, Christian Carmen, and James Evans from Puget Sound University. And they presented this work at a conference in Leiden in the Netherlands. Um, and the arguments were so difficult, I have to say, based on complicated aspects of Babylonian eclipse prediction practice, many assumptions, and I think most of us got lost, I certainly did, around a third of the way through or before then. So when they announced their result, which was astonishing, um, I think they must have been disappointed with our reaction. They said that the, they'd sequentially eliminated possibilities to determine that the full moon of month one of the dial is May the 12th, 205 BC. Not only 100 year range for them, a particular day <laughs> <laughs> on which the Saros dial started. Now I got lost even though I'd been studying this dial pretty intensively and I'd been looking at the uh, times in the glyphs, the eclipse times. And I believed that these times were not based on observations by the Greeks or even a set of earlier observations by, say, the Babylonians. I believe they were generated by a simple mathematical model using the methods of the time. And I developed a mathematical model for determining these times. And it's quite a good model. It's not, unfortunately, an exact model. I'm still working on this. But when I synchronized this mathematical model of the eclipse times with the astronomy, it produced a unique fit that the full moon of month one of the dial is May the 12th, 205 BC. I was completely astonished by this. I, my methods were very different from Christian and Jim's. In some ways, our assumptions were contradictory and the date was exactly the same. Now, I'd like to say with confidence that I can tell you this is the right date, but the truth is I believe this is the right date, but we haven't yet resolved what's going on here. It's, it's very difficult, I have to say. The two papers are there. Anyone's welcome to read them and try and sort it out, but I'm still working on it. I'm still working on this Eclipse Times model, which I've slightly improved, but I'm, I'm looking for an exact model. If they were using a mathematical model, it should give the exact results, and I've failed so far. Most of scientific research, as you'll know, is about failure, really. It's only <laughs> occasionally that you get uh, successes. So uh, I don't think we've done enough yet to persuade you as the academic community that this is right. I believe it's the right date, and it's a very interesting date. Let me put it on my timeline. It agrees with the archaeology. It agrees with the epigraphy, if you uh, agree with Charles Crowther. Uh, it agrees with the epicyclic lunar theory, if you think it was invented by Apollonius or his contemporaries or even earlier. And it's a very interesting date. It's much earlier than any previous date. The earliest previous date suggested was 150 BC. General consensus about 100 BC. And I think it's a very interesting date in terms of the next question, which is who made the mechanism. And I'm going to put up another timeline there. Uh, with some famous scientists and astronomers um, listed with their dates there. Some events you may be familiar with there to just locate you in the uh, history. This is all happening in the Hellenistic era. And this date really puts these astronomers, scientists into the frame. Archimedes was dead by just uh, seven years uh, with this date. Uh, my own belief is that Archimedes probably started the tradition of making these devices. The, um, uh, sorry, it started the tradition of making these devices. Um, we can't be certain of that, but the Cicero description is very remarkable. 
Eratosthenes, I really don't know, distinguished Greek astronomer, but no obvious connection with the mechanism. Apollonius, well, his uh, epicyclic theories of the planets were almost certainly um, uh, in, incorporated into the mechanism. The gearing's gone, so we can't be certain. Uh, and the theory of the moon, which may well be attributed to him, is also included. Maybe Apollonius worked with Archimedes. They knew each other, I understand. Um, but we really can't be sure. And of course, it might have been made by some unknown genius who has been lost to history because the historical record is so fragment, fragmentary, which you as classicists will be all too aware of. I'm going to finish on an animation of the mechanism which is an exploded diagram which comes together to form the mechanism. Nearly all of this gearing, particularly the gearing at the back, is now established. The planetary gearing at the front is conjectural, um, but something uh, calculating the planets was almost certainly there. And I'd like to quote Derek de Sola Price, who wrote, uh, it's frightening to know that the ancient Greeks, just before the fall of their great civilization, uh, came so close uh, to our own age, not only in their thought, uh, but in their scientific technology. I would say uh, that it's shocking. And I'm not going to answer the question why. I'm going to incorporate that into questions that you might have. Um, uh, I've just put a list of possibilities there, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Tony. Um, we can have one or two uh, questions. Any responses? Can take it? Yes. Is there some uh, new technological discovery that could help get more information about the, this uh, mechanism? Is there new te techniques beyond well, X-ray tomography that would help? Uh, I think that. We could do another X-ray analysis. X-ray technology has moved on and is higher <laughs> resolution. And we might therefore be able to resolve some of the uncertain letters in the inscriptions and things like this. But this is kind of a slightly marginal process, I think. And maybe the investment and the difficulties of doing it might not justify it. I'd, I'd love to do it myself, but I blanch at the thought of another five years to get permissions to do it. Um, the other thing, obvious thing is that uh, we'd love to find another of these mechanisms. And there's, a, you know, the, the problem is that this thing sticks up like a sore thumb in terms of the history of, of technology. The next mechanism you, you find that exists is a device about seven or eight hundred laters which is a Byzantine device called the London Sundial Calendar. Very simple device, had just about eight gears. And it's as if technology went backwards for that period. Uh, and then you have to go to the 14th century to a, uh, a, an astronomical clock made by Richard of, oops, sorry about that, uh, made by Richard of Wallingford um, in, at St. Albans. So it, it's, you know, it sticks up there. It doesn't have any predecessors. There must have been simpler devices before this. Nobody sort of sits down one day and builds something as sophisticated as this. It's impossible, isn't it? There must have been simple devices. Maybe something that would calculate the mean position of the moon in the zodiac, a few gears like Price's Metonic gear train. Um, but all these artifacts are missing. And I think the problem is that bronze artifacts that survived on the surface, as it were, that went in shipwrecks, nearly all got melted down in later history. Uh, one classicist told me that um, after the sack of Corinth, there were known to be, I think, 3,000 bronze statues there, and nothing at all survived, she said, not even a big toe. So 
the problem is that bronze things, you know, these mechanisms, they would have stopped working and they would have been melted down. It was such a valuable material. So we really have to look in shipwrecks. And the, the optimistic thing is now that there are really good technologies for looking <laughs> for shipwrecks, particularly deep shipwrecks. Recently in the, um, I think it's called the Fornai Archipelago, they found 22 wrecks, unexplored wrecks. They're probably just full of amphorae, but someday, maybe not in my lifetime, somebody will, may find another of these mechanisms and give us much more information. There's quite a lot of, um, the Cicero's, in, in BC times, there's Cicero's texts. There's a quote from by Truvius, which describes a similar type of thing, also first century BC, and in early, centuries AD, there are other um, quotes that describe similar devices used by uh, astronomers and astrologers and so on. So there's a, there's a sort of feeling that they were around. I'm sure it wasn't unique. I'm sure it was copied. I'm sure this wasn't the first version of it because there are very, very few mistakes in any of the inscriptions or the way the gears are cut. There's very few corrections that we can see. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it, I mean, it is hugely frustrating. Oh, just one more thing is that Pappus of Alexandria in the fourth century AD um, said that Archimedes had written a treatise called On Spheri. And it's thought that that treatise refers to these mechanisms. There's some argument about whether it does or whether the Spheri might have been actually more spherical. Um, but apart from that, we would absolutely love to find that treatise, you know. And I, I understood, for example, that there was a, a possibility that there's another library at Herculaneum. I don't know if anyone knows about this, buried deeper than the original library where there's all these charred manuscripts, which are, are beginning to be read. So there's a chance we might find some, uh, some uh, texts. Um, you know, remarkable things turn up, and I hope so. Yes, sir. If this technology had not been lost, how far do you think we would be now? Well, you know, where, where would we be now? Arthur C. Clarke wrote, he said that if the ancient Greeks had understood uh, the power, the strength of their technology, um, then they would have been able to get to the moon within the next 300 years, and we'd now be exploring the nearest stars it's a bit fanciful, honestly. It's a bit speculative. I don't know the answer. I, I'm not really a historian. I don't, um, I, it's really much over to you in terms of um, history. And I, I put here a whole, you know, even why it was made is not clear. I put a whole load of um, uh, ideas there that people have suggested, that it was a demonstration device. I thought, think it was much more than that. That it was some sort of rich person's toy, like a luxury astronomical watch people might uh, wear, well, maybe. It's been suggested it was an astrologer's tool, but I don't think we believe that because none of the inscriptions contains any scrap of astrology. It's all pure science that we can read. And I think if it was designed for astrology, there'd be a little bit and piece about ascendants and houses or whatever. My own view is that it was made as a mechanical cosmos by a great scientist uh, of vision who realized that you could use bronze gear wheels to model the cycles of the cosmos. Um, I don't think it was conceived as a calculating machine. If you look, calculating machines don't come till the 17th century with uh, Schickard's device and the Pascaline and so on. Um, and I think they didn't, I think they made this thing and then maybe looked around at what else, what else could you apply this sort of technology to? I think they answered, well, nothing really. Our normal daily lives don't follow these cycles that the heavens do, that are separate there. And they didn't think of the, the conceptual step of taking this technology, perfectly capable of making an adding machine or a multiplying machine. I think that that, that took nearly 2,000 years to happen because it's a huge conceptual leap that they didn't think of. But it's, uh, you know, it's very um, speculative. 
Was it a computer? Well, I, I made a, a, produced a film called The World's First Computer, or the BBC version's called um, The 2,000-Year-Old Computer. And I think in popular terms, it's fine to call it a computer. But in more technical terms, it's not really a computer. It doesn't have programs and stored programs and all the things we associated with modern computing. It's, it's closer to being a calculating machine, I think. I really can take one more question. There's a, obviously a, appears to be a lot of precision metalworking in this. Is this typical of the metalworking of the time? Well, the, uh, there's two things I can think of which show that they were very skilled in metalwork. First is if you look at the jewellery, ancient Greek jewellery, it is exquisite and fine and very detailed. They had the ability to work at this small scale. And the small scale itself is remarkable. It must have been made to be portable. You know, you'd, ne you'd never, you know, the, the pin and slot, the eccentric axes, just about 1.1 millimetres apart and had to be quite accurate um, and to, to mo properly model the, the variable motion of the moon. So it was made to very, and all the text, this tiny text, you know, you imagine, I don't know, haven't calculated yet, but it probably had 15 to 20,000 text characters on it, uh, on average 1.6 millimetres high. Um, one thing that um, is very remarkable is this proposal by Michael Wright of this coaxial pointer system at the front. You can imagine having to make eight coaxial tubes that fit closely inside each other, and he often quotes uh, the ancient Greek uh, aulos, which was a flute that had two concentric, very tightly fitting tubes to show that they had that capability. But it's still remarkable. Um, I should say that at University College London, uh, we're soon to begin two doctoral programmes, one with a, an absolutely brilliant student um, who's going to we're going to explore the making of the mechanism and the techniques that we used um, because it's not put together like a modern clock with all the gears separated with air spaces. Many of the gears appear to be touching each other. They move, they slide on these special sort of sliders. They have, the main drive wheel has these brackets that hold them down, completely against modern practice. It's made in a different way. Most of the models that you might see on the web are made using modern principles. We're exploring all those, you know, it's, it's the sort of original language of mechanical engineering and how they did that. So there's lots of um, questions that we want to try and answer in a very sort of experimental archaeology type of way, really. There are clearly many, many uh, more questions, uh, and some of yes. them, in fact, on the, on the board this very minute. <laughs> posed by Tony himself. But for now, uh, please join me in thanking Tony for sharing such virtuosic. <laughs> for sharing such virtuosic uh, study of such fascinating material. Thank you very much indeed. Can I say one more thing, Grant? Certainly. Um, if Archimedes had nothing to do with this, it, it's certainly cleverer than anything we know that Archimedes did make. So if Archimedes didn't have anything to do with it, who did? This is a real question, because it is a device of genius. It's just, you know, maybe there's some, somebody unknown, but, you know, it is cleverer than any of Archimedes' known devices. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.